raise your hand if you own any quote-unquote cryptocurrencies. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, a few couple, a few people. Um, who feels confident in being able to define what a blockchain is? Raise your hand. One person, two, three, four. Oh, my team, okay. <laughs> no one on the right side. Okay, cool. I'll give you my own slant. So, my name is Chris, and me and my partner run a venture fund out of Newport Beach, solely focused on blockchain investments. Um, we've been running the Ethereum meetups in Southern California for a couple of years now. So, on a weekly basis, we see anywhere between 50, or well, yeah, up to 50 a week, pitches of companies that are interested in uh, applying blockchain or creating a token of sorts, right? So we have seen a lot. We have seen a couple of hundred. So I call what I'm presenting my collateral insights based on those pitches. So take it for what it's worth. Do I have to click on something here? Okay. Typically that works when I click on stuff, right? Or not? Okay. Do I have to be closer? I'm here. You'll figure that out and I'll keep talking. I click a master. All right. So, my background is originally in law and we skipped a slide. And <laughs> I had the good fortune when I came out of law school, I ran into a small startup that was selling internet services. And if you remember 1996, uh, the first 56K modem came out that made internet and the World Wide Web somewhat bearable to, to browse, but we had to send out a lot of people uh, that would install, okay, I guess it's the old presentation, that would install a modem on everybody's computer and then actually configure it to um, some telecom company. And this is kind of where we are today in terms of blockchain. And to really understand blockchain, I encourage everybody to read this particular white paper. It's only eight pages long, and you really only need to internalize the first page. And the important part that is often skipped over, the, the real interesting invention is that Bitcoin introduced the concept of a digital bearer instrument. If you right now have any form of currency in your pocket, so printed paper money, that's a bearer instrument. So a bearer instrument is simply the fact that I can give it to Jason here. So now I don't have that particular dollar anymore and Jason has it and that's all that there is needed. And so that was what Bitcoin actually introduced. That's the principle of the blockchain. So the blockchain, what it does let you do is create value exchange protocols. So, oh, cryptocurrencies. So, how many cryptocurrencies do we need? Uh, probably as many as one. What do I mean, mean by that? So in the past, we used to pay for the minute when we talked to someone. We used to pay more if that someone was further away. This is kind of still how we treat money, right? So if someone's close by, then I pay a merchant account, I pay a couple of cents. If I send it to another country, guess what? You're, using, you're losing 20 to 25% of that value specifically in that remittance play. A lot of these things aren't currencies. So there's maybe six currencies right now, and what do I mean by that? So let's go back to how we still define money. So money is supposed to be a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and a store and storage of value. We're still using this definition, even though someone wrote this down in 1875. The other thing that was invented in 1875, by the way, is the telephone. So the telephone changed significantly, so it changed money, but we're still using the same definition. So what I'd like you to understand is the following. This is not money. This is an IOU. Right? And so this is very important to understand in terms of what it does as a technology. It's very bad technology because really what currency s solves is what I call 
the cow problem. Cow is short for coincidence of wants. I have a cow and I want a beer and it's really hard to exchange a cow for a beer. So hence we invent, invent, um, invented currencies. So currency is anything that solves the cow problem, that solves the coincidence of wants problem. So what you'll probably never see is this. This represents 25 cents. So don't ever expect to see a price being shown in Bitcoin. There's a couple of things you can buy with Bitcoin, obviously, at this point in time. But don't really expect to see this anytime soon on any consumer good. So what blockchain creates is the Internet of Value Exchange. So we started off with one protocol, the Internet Protocol. We added a couple of others, file transfer. Actually, file transfer came before, TCP, SMTP. You do not put a stamp on an email, do you? At the same time when we invented the SMTP protocol for email, we should have invented money over IP. But this is exactly what Bitcoin introduced. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's more gold over IP because people are holding it, or you probably have heard the term hodling. What people are working on right now are more of these asset exchange protocols. So right now, the low-hanging fruits are blockchain-native pro blockchain assets, such as Bitcoin. The next section is digitally native assets. So if you have an in-game character in your game, you'll be able to own this character. You'll be able to take it with you, use it in your next game. You will be able to sell it peer-to-peer. -peer. I can show you after the presentation if you're interested. So, and then lastly, and that's a very important topic that two other speakers already covered, identity over protocol. A lot of what needs to be built is attached to identity. So specifically, anybody that's out there and that's trying to sell you a security token, there aren't any security tokens. There will be security tokens after we solve identity. Why do I say that? Because the token in a context of blockchain is part of the peer-to-peer -peer exchange stack. Means if you can trade it peer-to-peer -peer on a public blockchain, it's not a token. It's tethered to someone's platform. And also, oftentimes, people use that term private blockchain. There aren't private blockchains. These are fancy databases of sorts. If, simple test. If this company goes away and the function or the token entirely goes away, it's not part of the blockchain. It's very simple. So this is actually a graphic I adapted from some we see up in the Bay Area, as you've probably seen it. I adapted it slightly because he initially proposed that, hey, in the past or up until now, most of the value was being captured on what we call the application layer, and this underlying protocol layer didn't really get much attention. So the protocols that I showed before that make up the internet. So in the future, he proposed we kept start capturing the value on the protocol layer. So we move assets directly on IP. So Bitcoin would be the obvious one, and then anything that I can translate into a smart contract as long as it's part of mainnet. I'll explain the concept later if you want me to. And then cute kittens, right? So what can you buy real quick? I mean, if you wanted to, you can uh, buy Amazon gift cards using BitPay, and you can buy your trip on Expedia with, with Bitcoin using Coinbase, but you still need an intermediary of sorts at the moment. This is not native. These are layer two solutions. If you haven't seen this one, this sold out within a couple of hours when it came about, Casa. This is a lightning node, it's a layer two solution on top of Bitcoin. There's a lot of people that keep complaining about this idea that Bitcoin only does four transactions per second. That point is entirely and utterly irrelevant because it's not about that. This will do as many transactions as you want. Um, the other part being a point of sale system. So you will see within the next year, point of sale system that we will stop using old financial transactional systems that use the Swiss system. It's entirely, utterly ridiculous at this DNH. 
that the bank closes at five, that your money disappears and all of a sudden it shows up someplace else 24 hours later. Where does it go? Well, with these layers, this will no longer happen. Um, what will first have to be developed though, and this is the more important part is as a venture capitalist, you don't want to invest into the first social media company, you want to invest into the last. So our initial investments have been mostly been on the infrastructure level, so on the protocol level, and then the low-hanging fruits, finance. Finance is overall ready for disruption. Right? A lot of finance is already digitally native. Most of your dollars are zeros and ones in some database, right? But right now they're being custodied by banks. Uh, smart contract, I think we touched on that earlier, so I always really like this idea of a smart contract as like a vending machine. So you write it, you throw in the coin and something else comes out. I find that very helpful as, an, as a visual for it. And then, uh, another concept that I really like is this IoT concept, but with blockchain baked in. So this is actually the guy who initially uh, wrote the DAO that then failed, but they pivoted and do something useful now. So this is basically Airbnb in a box. So it's a door lock that has blockchain built in with an application. So you can run your own Airbnb and you don't have to pay that company 15, 20% of what you're making. And this, the other app that they're working on, is basically Uber in a box. Oracles are anything that you can put in, push in from the outside into your blockchain and the blockchain reacts to it. So it would be an RSS feed or would be your door lock, would be something on an IoT device. Really great concept, underutilized. So, as I mentioned, what first will be disrupted are those companies that raised hundreds of millions of dollars, but they're super centralized, and on top of that still are using the old financial rails that everybody in the room, including myself, are paying for. Because the one thing you have to realize is you're paying on an average 5% more than you have to, right? It's like you're still, we're still putting stamps on money that we are sending when it's no different than sending an email. Um, this is a thing that I made 14 years ago and no one was interested in that and now all of a sudden everybody is realizing that, hey, if you're not paying for it, you're the product, right? So take the typical Google example. Google is not a search engine, right? Google is a marketing company and its business is to sell your data. So this will stop. And this will stop not because everything is going to be anonymous, because blockchain for the most part are pseudonymous and it really only takes four data points to figure out who you are. But it's mostly because of the data regulation that was touched on earlier. But the interesting part is really to figure out who you are in the digital world to then attach assets reliably to you, such as securities. But again, you need to figure out identity first. Last topic, my favorite one. What's mostly broken with our current implementation of um, monetary systems and corporations is this for-profit paradigm. The reason why Google treats everybody in the room here as their products is because they are for-profit company, right? So everything that they do is being derived from that particular purpose. The first objective will always be to monetize you to increase shareholder value. And they pick this business model of advertising. So what do they have to do to increase shareholder volume? volume? Make you click on more ads. So what decentralized autonomous corporations can do, and Bitcoin was the first example of a decentralized autonomous corporation or organization for that matter, is align the interests of everybody taking part in this particular endeavor. So if you are the typical for-profit corporation, what's happening is the employees have different interests from the shareholders. The operators have different interests from the investors. Right? So as an employee, I want to potentially work the least, make the most. As a 
um, investor, I just want the most profit out of it, regardless of any externalities. So with this particular system, you could actually fix that. So where does this lead us? So this is kind of an idea of how I see things evolving in the future. I might be wrong, but now we have blockchain native assets. As much as you can create those, you are able to create immediate value for people. The next thing is anything that's digitally native. Right now, when you buy, quote unquote, a song on iTunes, you don't really own it, right? You get the right to use it on five different devices, but you can't sell it to me, right? You paid 99 cents or a dollar 29 it is right now, but once you don't like it anymore, you can't sell it to me. I could do this in the past, right? I would buy a, a record or a CD, and if I didn't like it anymore, I would sell it to someone else for less money. Well, on blockchain, with what we call non-fungible tokens, you will be able to do this again. You can reliably track ownership and create a scenario where you move that ownership from you to someone else and you don't have access to that particular item anymore if it's digital. So from there, we then can sort of onboard other commodities. So what our services are um, starting to do in the first quarter of next year is, is do something like an initial wine offering, initial whiskey offering. Sounds really funny, but the idea being that you can record reliably a single bottle of wine on a blockchain that's being represented by one blockchain entry that resembles a QR code on that particular bottle of wine. You don't necessarily have to take delivery. You can just resell it. And there's obviously other advantages with that. You can see that there were only so many produced, so as soon as more of those get actually used, the value of that single one that you hold potentially increases and so forth. So and at the end, again, we need to solve identity before we can actually move into the security as well. Because otherwise you will still be tethered to some platform. Everybody who's trying to sell you on their platform is not selling you on the blockchain. Do we have time for questions? Awesome. Lady, hang on, I'll give you the microphone. Everybody wants to hear a question. Thank you so much, this is very informative. So if the typical corporate structure is LLC or C Corp, what is the legal corporate structure for a DAO? Simple answer, there is none. There is no legal structure. And so I want to clarify something. I used to be a lawyer. I'm not anymore. I stopped being a lawyer back in 2000 when we sold our company back in, in Germany. Um, but so the one thing that people always say is stupid stuff like, hey, um, regulators will regulate the blockchain. Regulators do not get to regulate technology. They regulate citizens, natural and corporations. Very important distinction. So whenever a regulator do something, most likely they're in some form affecting your rights. No, they're not affecting the technology. Technology moves, right? So blockchain in that sense is mostly like the internet. I'm gonna start singing if no one asks. Walk that far. Glad to save you some steps. Uh, would you say that the decentralized um, autonomous organizations are the future versus the private corporations? Yes. <laughs> That's the short answer. <laughs> so um, I don't know if everybody heard it. Um, the gentleman was asking whether or not I think that the EOS are the future. And they are to large parts. Um, the one simple example I always make for this, if you had a search engine where the interests of the users were aligned with the interests of the operators, it would be way more likely providing you with a useful result, right? Because it's not gonna have to rely on having you click on five ads before you get to that particular result. You and I could make a better search engine in a heartbeat, right? We just filled out everything with commercial intent. So if you have a decentralized autonomous organization, 
in that particular space. People will move to it really fast. I don't know. You probably remember the days when you had Yahoo and then you discovered Google. It took a couple of weeks before people caught up to the fact that this was a much better result. So that could happen real fast. But this is just one of the many examples. If, I mean, if you have a restaurant, you typically also try to optimize uh, for profits, right? So you pick the cheapest meat that lasts the longest and so forth. So you can take that same paradigm into most areas of business where you align the, the interest of the stakeholders. So the, the produ producers, the consumers, etc. The typical example would always be if as a Apple buyer I needed to be a shareholder, I would have a larger interest in that product itself. I would start selling it, I would start marketing it to other people. So in large droves the answers will in my opinion be yes, because all of a sudden you can actually align the interest of everybody involved in this particular ecosystem. That's the most disruptive aspect that blockchain provides in my opinion. And that's why you can't kill Bitcoin. Well, people don't realize you can shut down the, the internet and Bitcoin will still work. Oh, sure. Zeka heads our data science team at our company. Um, he was asking how we tie in identity and securities, right? So uh, the reason being is in different jurisdictions, there's different uh, determinations whether or not uh, you can buy a particular asset. I mean, the, the typical one that we all know here in the United States is you have to be an accredited investor to participate in certain security seals, which makes no sense whatsoever because everybody knows you can just plunge $5,000 on red in any casino in Nevada and no one takes an issue with that. So from that perspective, there's a lot of what we call identity platforms right now. Again, if it's a platform, it's not a blockchain, uh, that sell quote unquote security tokens, but you have to phone home, meaning that platform checks whether or not you fulfill the criteria to be able to actually own this asset. What you will see moving forward, so I, I use this one example here of one, and now shut it off, good, uh, of one particular standard. So ESC is uh, Ethereum request for comment. It's a standard for a protocol. What that means is it communicates with the blockchain in a very specific, uh, specific fashion. So you will see a lot of evolution on top of that, and some of which we are supporting right now, that integrate those different levels, i.e. the fact that I'm an accredited investor or that I'm a US citizen, that I'm male, et cetera, on the public blockchain. And then you can correlate this back to an asset that requires these criteria and you can match it on the public blockchain without needing to phone home to a platform of sorts. Now I'm going to get to you. No, don't yell. We want it on tape. We're going to replay it over and over. Fantastic. I love to be replayed. Um, so in the wine, initial wine offering, how do you know when someone drinks the wine? Actually, that will be a question for Jonathan. That Jonathan really likes to answer. He is on our analyst team. Um, that's more a part of the practical implementations of that, so we're reaching out to other companies. But uh, the great example that Jonathan made for that, if you uncork it, there's a second private key under there. <laughs> Does it make sense? <laughs> This might just be my own ignorance, but um, so uh, if, if people's identities uh, are for, for authentication are kept on the blockchain, then how do you authenticate against that? I'm, I'm used to the Microsoft way of thinking. You'd have like a, a federated trust and active directory and that sort of thing. How do you keep it all within the blockchain, which I think is what you're, uh, you were talking about here for, for uh, identities? Right. I mean, in a similar fashion, uh, there, we're working on, not we, but uh, pe other people working on identity protocols, uh, 725, I believe. Um, but so you will be the owner of that private key for your entry. 
So in other people will simply confirm, not other people, but people running that blockchain level, that you're a US citizen, that you're male, and so forth. You're creating, it's a non-fungible token in that sense on a blockchain level. Uh, I know in the hacker community, we do uh, PGP signing parties. Um, I feel like it's very similar to that. It, yes, it's very similar to that, and it's more granular in, at the same way. Yeah, exactly. Entire time, right? Uh, and one more time for slow people who might be sitting in the chair right in front of you. Uh, could you draw the link between uh, blockchain and DAO one more time? Because I understand DAO, I understand blockchain, but I'm not quite seeing how the one creates the possibility for the other. So the key, as always, is decentralization. So Bitcoin was the first DAO because as you know, there is no Bitcoin Inc., right? There's no rent-seeking entity that um, actually maintains the network. You can join the network tomorrow, right? You download the source code, start running a node, and you get rewarded for that if you happen to win this particular block reward and you figure out um, the right answer to that particular puzzle. So everybody in the system, as soon as you own this, now you've got ownership in the system, right? So people always make this example of, hey, uh, it's, so it's, it's so centralized, right? All these miners in, in China, they, they, they could own 51%. So what? W would they go in against their own interests? Right? The, it's super valuable to them. So would they take it over and ruin it for everybody else? Guess what? It's open source. You'll just move on, right? You having an ownership in this particular network, it's all you need. It's your interest to stabilize that network. It's in the best of your interest. So you create an... <laughs> sure. A, rest, a decentralized restaurant? In steps. In steps. So we could all in the room decide hey, we really like restaurants, let's, let's all pitch in. Let's create a DAO, everybody contributes 10 Ether to this particular wallet. This particular wallet then gets out and starts sourcing the individual pieces needed. Enters into a rental contract, starts setting up supply systems, and everybody can also just contribute and contribute labor. I mean, that's, hap that's happening every day. I mean, me evangelizing is part of making this uh, network more stable. Right? So you can just join for a common cause, and you, you get that particular token back. We call it the restaurant token. We decide the restaurant token is worth 10 Ether. So everybody in the room chips in at 10 Ether, and then this entity might either get more valuable because it starts serving more people and so your token will go up in price or it doesn't. But there's no one leading it. You can imagine a wide variety of governments models, right? So you can start introducing stay and I'm being asked to stop, okay? Uh, <laughs> proof of work. Proof. I, I think at the end of the day, and that's the last thing then, uh, you will always have multiple versions of proof systems. The, the thing that we have now that's mostly dominated by proof of work, that's probably not gonna last. Okay. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Christian.